little uh, technical uh, issues. It's okay. Right. So um, the sun is 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 virtually an endless source of energy. It's there for uh, four and a half billion years. It'll be there for for another, I think, couple of billions of years. Um, it's it, there's so much potential in it, so much energy in it. Every sunlight is radiated into space. It's, some of them we we captured on Earth, but the other other part is just just goes away. And uh, really, there are no uh, sunsets or, or evenings in the space. And there are stars only, and they, they shine all the time. And um, there's a potential in it, and it's, um, it, it gives us a uh, possibility to, to use it more effectively through space-based solutions. And that's, uh, that's what I'm going to talk about. And it's not that we don't really consider it. Here is the growth of solar energy systems. It's, it's a, this is, this is a, a 2019 data and the projection for 2020 and 2021. Uh, and this is the, the growth of um, solar energy systems in, uh, throughout the, the world, the, the capacity. And, and the numbers aren't so important, but you see the growth in the, um, over the years, even, even uh, between 2006 and 2021, now that uh, it, it grows exponentially and it will, it will uh, likely to grow um, further. Uh, in the future, but what what I'm going to really focus on are the, um, the really the large scale solar farms, and this this uh, um, oh, I'm not changing it here. I realize that now. Um, the, the really the large scale systems are that we have um, the, the the actual numbers in this in this uh, map isn't so important either. But the look at the colors that the, the red ones are the ones we get the most sunlight. Uh, throughout the year, uh, blue and, and purple bits are, are a little less, and UK is a bit unfortunate in that sense. And this um, this talk is also uh, will you know give a give an overview of how we can actually make uh, make space based solutions to to provide solar energy for countries like the UK as well. And um, as you see, um, we are actually exploiting this potential in a way that um, we have solar power farms that are that can power of large cities. Um, and those are, you know, we have, we have some in North America, some in Africa and, and uh, Asia and uh, Australia as well. But one of the problems with the earth-based systems is that um, there's a limited amount of day that you can use the sun. And that's very straightforward, I, I suppose, for, uh, for all of us. The, um, um, after maybe 12 hours at most, then the sun uh, basically disappears. It goes into, we go into the night side and we won't be able to um, use the solar energy um, anymore. And I think according to some uh, calculations, this is about um, 25 to 30% of the, the whole year we actually use solar energy. And that makes the uh, really the market share of solar energy and say electricity generation really low. And now, uh, even though we can, you know, obviously there are other places that we can further uh, exploit solar energy, uh, we can also go to space, basically. And where there's no sunset, we can capture, harvest the solar energy in space and somehow, you know, beam it back to the Earth and we can use it uh, on the Earth 24 hours or in an extended uh, period of time, even if, it, if it's not 24 hours. And by, by this way, we can, we can use solar energy in, in say, what we call critical day, uh, hours of the day, such as sunset or sunrise, where there's a lot of electricity demand or solar um, you know, energy demand in general, but also the prices are really high. But there's no really like solar energy input because the sun is really low in the horizon and it's not really effective uh, to be used in the... Um, in these solar farms or solar power plants, um, we have we have more things to to be hopeful about using space technologies for these kind of things as well. And that is really the um, as the rockets uh, sort of in the space technology grows um, bigger and bigger, and um, the the prices with the commercialization of space technology, uh, the, the prices of launching things into space is um, getting lower. And that's one of the Biggest challenges that we have in um, um, in you know sending things into space or, or having large scale projects is because 
the uh, sending things into space is really expensive and they never really become uh, cheap enough to make it profitable, if you like. So the, uh, the largest rocket we have is now is Saturn V and it took us to the moon. Uh, we don't use that that often anymore. Or maybe we don't use it at all. I'm not really sure. But we have, uh, we have another rocket uh, that's a uh, Starship, that's Elon Musk's rocket. Uh, while I'm not a huge fan of himself, um, Starship is today the, the biggest rocket um, we will hopefully have soon. And um, with the commercialization of this, the, the space launch, is it, um, there's a potential that the launch cost could, could go really cheap. And that's, when I say cheap, I'm talking about actually, um, well, I gave the example when I was in uh, Glasgow, I gave the example train ticket from Glasgow to Edinburgh per kilogram, but it's, it's about 30 quid really. Uh, and it can be launching one kilogram of an object into space could be as, as cheap as 30, um, 30 quid. And that doesn't take you from Glasgow to London, to be honest. Um, um, yeah, and, uh, and the other thing, that we can be hopeful about. So, is it so oh, okay. <laughs> uh, the the other thing we can be hopeful about is the advances in space technology. So I'll I'll uh, talk about a little bit more uh, later on. But we didn't really have the when the ideas were coming in in the past, especially when the space race was um, was going in in full force in in 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, we didn't really have the technologies keep up with the ideas that's coming up, such as, um, you know, assembling things in orbit or, you know, just taking the material and manufacturing in orbit. And we really rely on manufacturing everything on Earth and taking up space. That's another um, uh, driver for high costs um, in, uh, in space technology programs. And we have now really the research uh, projects uh, going on, uh, especially, you know, 3D manufacturing or the uh, 3D printing uh, in space and, and other, other similar uh, strategies. The research is ongoing for you know, assembling things in space or manufacturing things in space. So that's something we can be hopeful about. And these, these will all come together in a, in a second when I, um, I talk about space-based solar energy solutions. And we can actually uh, you know, hit really two birds with one stone here, and that would be Oh, right, uh, and two birds with one stone here. And that's uh, while we can use the technologies to provide clean energy, at the same time, we can remove the, all these coals and um, you know, the, all these uh, carbon heavy uh, um, uh, energy sort of uh, producing systems out of the uh, cycle so that we can actually both uh, power our cities with um, you know, clean energy systems or solar energy in this case, and just uh, to take the um, uh, heavy carbon footprint systems out of the uh, cycle. Right, uh, and here I'll, I'll go into space-based solutions. And uh, so the, the, the first thing um, is that space is used for data for um, so many years already. So we actually measure our atmospheric, um, uh, you know, atmosphere, ionosphere or, or other, uh, we monitor our, our climate, our oceans for, for so many years. But here, what I'm going to talk about is actually um, uh, using space for bringing down physical resources, not just um, you know, electronic bits of data, but physical resources, and that's energy. Um, here, um, two sort of solutions appear to be more uh, the, the, the most prominent, really. Uh, one of them is solar power satellites. I'll talk about the first. And the second is orbiting solar reflectors. It's, these are sort of complementary solutions uh, um, in, in different ways. And the second one, orbiting solar reflectors, is what I'm working on at the moment. And I, I just uh, uh, spare that for the, as, as the last thing. Right. Uh, it's not going, okay. All right, let's start with uh, solar power satellites. The, the idea of solar power satellite comes uh, apparently in, uh, in a book of uh, Isaac Asimo in the 1940s, um, where he talks about uh, stations in, uh, in around the Earth orbit, beaming down limitless energy to, uh, to the Earth. And, um, 
and it's 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 interesting because uh, when I was preparing for this talk and for other talks as well, I, I realized uh, however many uh, sci-fi ideas were actually uh, tried to be um, you know um, um, investigated in uh, in the past, and this is this is one of them. But really, the the actual um, the development in solar power satellite comes with uh, late '60s, with um, um, you know someone getting a patent on uh, wireless power transmission. And then uh, the research really gets stuck in, um, in where, you know, making launches um, uh, cheaper or, or, you know, not being able to uh, getting things in space cheap enough. But the, uh, the concept, here's the concept. And that's, uh, I think, uh, it, this picture sort of explains everything quite well, is that the sun is, is, is coming to, uh, to the satellite and the satellite could be the, the earth can be in in night or in darkness but the satellite is is seeing the sun in orbit so that's that's where again the sun never sets and the um mind that the satellites are already using solar panels to generate energy but they use it for their own operation so to, to survive in space in this case the, the solar panels capture the energy and turn that into some form of um, microwave or some form of other method to send it to the earth. And there's a receiver station on earth that receive this um, uh, energy and then convert it into electricity. And then we, we basically uh, implement that into or, or send it into to a power grid and use it in, in our cities. So, Again, this, this the, uh, the, 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 um, oh, I guess I can also show that the, the sun gets, uh, the, the sunlight is, is, uh, is got by, uh, gotten by the, the solar panels. It's been used and turned it into some form of microwave and beamed down to Earth. And there is a receiving station on Earth and that captures the, um, uh, the, the, the energy. So, in, in this way, it's actually a standalone solar power farm in space that um, you know, uses um, the, the, the solar power that's available in space and, and sends, it, uh, sends it to the Earth. Yeah. Um, how big is the receiving station have to be? Because it has to be relatively close to the city, but yeah. it, um, I assume to be viable, it has to be a large spaceship. Yes, so uh, I'll actually come to that, but okay. uh, I, can, I can quickly explain as well. And that's a uh, receiving station has to be really big. It can be in, um, uh, up, up a couple of kilometers in sizes, because um, uh, as I again will will come in a, in a second, the orbit has to be really high, have to be really high, and um, in order to you know really capture most of the energy that is beamed down uh, in that uh, in that distance, the, the receiving station has to be has to be big as well, uh, and that's what that's one of the you know potential disadvantages, but not necessarily a disadvantage. It's just uh, um, it's just uh, one thing that has to be that physics physics work that way um yeah so but how high this the satellite has to be and this is quite uh, a, a sort of kind of confusing figure but i think i think it also gives a lot of overview on on where our satellites are most of the stuff we have around the earth is actually around here that's the international space station that's hubble space telescope and everything pretty much everything is is around here and this, uh, and this is called low Earth orbit, uh, LEO or LEO, um, however you'd like to call it. And we have this medium Earth orbit, that's MEO, and that's where all the GPS, Galileo, and these are all the, the satellites for uh, navigation, the ones that is used in your Google Maps or Apple Maps or whatever um, navigation app you are using. Uh, GPS is, is American, which is widely known by everyone. Galileo is European, Lonas Russian. I do is Chinese. And there is another orbit, and that's a really special orbit. Uh, that's called geostationary Earth orbit. And it's geostationary because um, when it's, it's, it, it's at a height that it turns at the same speed as the Earth itself. So if I'm really like looking to you, we are, we are turning in the same way that we are always looking at each other for 24 hours. So that's where communication satellites are, like like Turksat or other other satellites are in this orbit, 
and it's a, it's a really special orbit that is actually regulated in, in where and uh, where and who can use where really. Now I'll strip down this figure in the in this slide. That's uh, that's where GEO is about thirty six thousand kilometer from the Earth's surface, and that's where I talked about like where everything is. It's it's within one thousand kilometer from the Earth's surface, so that's the altitude that we have. So it's everything we have is very close to the Earth, but everything uh, you know the telecommunication satellites and um, well solar power satellites as well. I just talked, uh, just gave the hint, are in, in GEO as well. And the motion here is kind of, as, as I explained, if you really had a like stone in a, in a rope, and if you turn in the same speed with the stone, you would have the rope is, is turning with you, right? And that's, uh, that's kind, of the, uh, kind of the thing. And if, if you were in LEO, that the stone would turn so fast, it starts twirling around you. And that's, that's kind of the, uh, I guess the more intuitive way to explain this, and that's uh, the, the the image on the right sort of explains the uh, geo uh, motion. Um, Arthur C. Clarke uh, is the um, really the oops, uh, the one the one uh, proposed uh, another sci-fi sort of science uh, um, crossover here. Arthur C. Clarke is is, uh, is said to be the first person who proposed to use this uh, orbit for communication satellites. And that's where we use, um, we will use the, um, uh, our solar power satellites, because we would like to, we would like to beam down power for hours, um, seven days. So it's, it will be a constant power transmission from the space to the earth, um, except for about one hour that the uh, geostationary earth orbit also goes into earth's eclipse for about one hour a day. But in general, that it's it's practically a sort of um, constant uh, use of solar power from space. Um, and yes, uh, we will we will need uh, big stations. But the, the pros are with the the solar power satellites is that you get the the sunlight in space um, in an orbit, and you just beam it down and microwave isn't really affected by the atmospheric um, uh, conditions. So places like the UK, for example, which the UK government actually put some money on a feasibility study for solar power satellite only re uh, recently, that the, if you use a solar power satellite, London can be rainy or you know, Glasgow can be rainy, but if you have, a, I don't know, the cost of, of the UK, if you have a receiver station and if you have a satellite up in space, can actually get solar energy for UK in the UK, or that could be for anywhere really, and and that would be uninterrupted through rain, clouds, or whatever. And that would that's that's one of the biggest disadvantages of Earth-based solar energy systems. If the sky is cloudy, you don't get sunlight. Um, but if you're in space, there's no such thing. Like you don't you don't really uh, you're not really uh, obstructed by that. And the transmission is safe. Uh, there are studies, uh, people thought that microwave can be very dangerous, but it's actually not. The intensities aren't uh, greater than, no greater than midday sun. And the, um, so if you, it, I mean, if you are more sort of technically minded or good with numbers, they, they can deliver uh, the solar energy about, or electricity about one um, gigawatt hour. Um, and that is enough to power a large city. Uh, that's that's uh, um, if, if you don't want to deal with numbers, that's all you need to. The solar power satellite can actually power a large city um, very easily. And the one of the cons is that is it's it's a very big system. It's 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 huge, and it, there are many space launches needed to assembly in orbit. And that's one of the biggest still disadvantages, or you know, um, um, uh, that that. that one of the things that make it infeasible, really. Um, and a terrestrial receiver has to be several kilometers across in order to, to get uh, sunlight on ground or the energy on ground. And because it's so high up, it's nearly impossible to repair if something goes wrong. So that's, uh, that's one of the uh, challenges. But nearly impossible to repair thing is, is true for any space system, really. Like we used to, uh, when there are space shuttles, we used to repair Hubble Space Telescope and so on by astronauts. But that's not really the case anymore. So it's, 
it's really difficult to repair because it's so far out. Right, so this was solar power satellite. I hope uh, that was interesting. And I'll go to the second system. And that's, uh, oops, um, and that's the uh, orbiting solar reflectors. That's really what I'm working on. And that's, uh, that's uh, and this image was prepared by uh, a, a colleague of mine um, as a rather complementary system. And that's, that's different than solar power satellite in the, in the sense that um, it doesn't capture uh, the, the sunlight and turn it into electricity, but it really use, use it as, as, as a mirror uh, to um, illuminate solar power farms locally uh, on the surface to extend their day of operation. So it's, it's, it's using the so terrestrial solar power systems rather than being a standalone solar power farm on, uh, on orbit. Right, and this, uh, this this concept has has a connection with this film, and it's from 1929. Uh, it's considered to be it's a silent film, sci-fi. It's considered to be for its time one of the best uh, sci-fi films. Um, it has some inaccuracies, uh, you know, having gold on the moon or or atmosphere on the moon, but in general, it's um, uh, it's considered to be one of the the best sci-fi's uh, for its time. I mean, it's, it's by Fritz Lang, who's very famous for his other sci-fi right. predictions yeah. as well. Yeah. And right. And there was a, there was a guy in this, uh, in this film uh, who was a, a consultant for the scientific accuracy. And he was also tasked to, to launch a rocket in the, um, in the opening of, uh, of, of the film in Berlin. And that was Hermann Obert. He was considered to be one of the pioneers of uh, modern space technology and rocketry today. Um, and he has a book in the same year as as the uh, as the film. It's called Ways to Space Flight, which which I know from its technical translation by by NASA. And this uh, lower right, uh, if, if if you can see, there's a oh, uh, isn't very bright. But um, so this this image, they, I I put the text myself, but uh, he explains this concept called uh, well what we call now orbiting solar reflectors or orbiting reflectors that. Uh, that incoming sun rays uh, by on this right to left can be um, you know def deflected sort of by a mirror in space and to be uh, used to illuminate night sides of, of the Earth. Um, he has some controversial uh, ideas in the book, such as uh, you know melting uh, polar caps to open new ship routes and so on. Uh, which we would avoid at all costs today, but uh, you know that climate emergency or climate change wasn't really a thing in 1920s, I suppose. Um, and he also um, talks about uh, illuminating uh, airports or making northern latitudes uh, livable um, in winter, winter time with uh, illuminating them by by mirrors in in space, um, and. Uh, yeah, well, the, the concept is really in a, in a more sort of uh, hopefully uh, uh, animated way is, is that there's a sun and there's, there's the a part of the earth is in the, uh, is in the night side. But we have a, a mirror sort of that, that sees the sun and the earth at the same time. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's sort of um, rotated or uh, oriented in a way that it can, it can illuminate, uh, you know, bits of the earth. This is not to scale, so don't, don't think that I've, we are illuminating half the in Indian uh, Indian continent, but uh, say there is a, there's a solar power farm here. You can locally illuminate this uh, this area, not the whole Earth, but this. So there's there's I, I won't I won't play it here. I don't think we have time. But there's a there's a really nice uh, video that again my colleague prepared. So just just go ahead in YouTube and and search Soul Space. Uh, he'll be happy that you you saw um, you saw his uh, video. Um, yeah, and. If if you just look at this in a oops sorry uh, that's my job here <laughs> right right so if you look at this in a more uh, sort of close up way the incoming sunlight is coming to the reflector and we are illuminating solar power locally by really projecting the image of a solar disk and it goes through the atmosphere and there are lots of and etc but um, that's just this is really um, what you need to know about the system. So it's, as you see, it's quite different from solar power satellites. So you don't 
uh, generate electricity in space. You just you just become an intermediary um, and and just help solar power farms get a little bit extra sunlight to extend their day. Uh, Right to generate more uh, uh, energy, and the um, right it, it, the concept is studied uh, for, for many years in the uh, late sixties, seventies, um, especially when there's apparently oil crisis, um, and eighties for other applications. Russians in nineteen nineties actually launched um, a mirror uh, in space in nineteen ninety three. Um, actually eliminated them. People uh, reported there's there's not really a paper as, aside from an, a New York Times article that I found, um, uh, but people reported seeing a flash of lights uh, in uh, in space or or, in, or on ground. Uh, but the, the subsequent um, uh, opportunities to send mirrors sort of in space or reflectors in space um, kind of failed and eventually uh, the, the interest got lost. But with the sort of climate emergency need for global clean energy uh, services and so on, just revitalized the concept in uh, 2010s. And if you think the concept is looking really futuristic to you, there's actually an application in this uh, Southern and Norwegian town. This town is in between two valleys and uh, because the, the, the hill is too high, the, the, it obstructs the sunlight incoming. So the town gets, gets dark after a while uh, in, a, in sometime in the afternoon. So they used um, a mirror up here to illuminate their town center. So as you see, it's not a full sort of daylight kind of sun. It's sort of quite uh, deflected, quite dispersed sunlight. It's more like sunset or, or sunrise type of uh, situation. But this actually ex explains the concept really well. So this part is in darkness, and there's a mirror up there. This could be space uh, or uh, you know orbit. Um, it sees both the sun and the town at the same time, and it just illuminates it. So that's uh, that's what we do uh, in, in this concept. And well, um, this was more sort of relevant to my talk last week. But the, we have also a mirror in uh, Glasgow in Kibble Palace in Botanic Garden where it's used to, um, to, to, to get sunlight for the plants inside, the, um, um, inside this, uh, this, this um, building where there's you know, greeneries. Uh, greeneries. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, out of all the places they could have illuminated, they illuminated a car park, I think. Yeah, so that's a town center, actually. I mean, but I guess there's, there's, there's a car, well, car park, I suppose. <laughs> uh, but there are images. So uh, because of like, potential copyright reasons, I didn't, I didn't put uh, them. But there are, there are images of people actually basking in the sun with this uh, with the system. So uh, it seems like people enjoy it. Um, anyway, but the mirrors that we are going to use in space are not really uh, monolithic sort of mirrors that you, know, you would use in your bathroom. It's more like thin, really delicate structures, like more more like aluminum foils, if you like, but very reflective. Um, and you use them now as, uh, as, a, as a method of sort of sailing in space with uh, the, the pressure of sunlight, it's called solar sailing. Um, and the idea is to, to, to use these things um, uh, instead of, well, as mirrors in space to, to eliminate. These, these structures wouldn't really work on Earth, but they work really well, well in space because uh, the you know, absence of gravity or, you know, low gravity, really. Um, and yeah, the technology is there because we use them. Uh, the, this is a Japanese spacecraft in space. Uh, it's, it's used solar sails as, uh, in this case, as a method of uh, sort of propulsion to the space. And it's much like wind, wind sailing on Earth. You just use sunlight pressure instead of the wind. Right. Um, and yeah, so I'll uh, just briefly go into the, the the final bits and the pros of uh, orbiting solar reflectors is decoupled from terrestrial systems. It's usually in, in low orbits um, and it, it really services the solar power farms that um, for the designed um, orbits. Uh, and compared to solar power satellites, it's low, uh, low complexity so because you have only a, a reflective surface and some spacecraft uh, you know, system, but it's 
it's not as big as, as solar power satellites and uh, it's not as complex that really requires multiple launches to, to assemble and so on. But um, on the other hand, it's enough to power only a medium sized town. So the energy uh, delivered is relatively low or the sunlight delivered is relatively low. Um, Another thing is it's interrupted by the cloud cloudiness because you, you send the, the real sunlight back to the earth rather than in some other form. And uh, because of the illumination, there's, there's potentially regulatory issues that we can discuss. Um, and uh, there's also a potential technology requirement for as similar to solar power satellite for in, in orbit assembly and manufacturing. Right. And um, but, Orbiting solar reflectors can be used for other things as well. That's, a, that's a, one of the primary differences with the solar power satellite. Solar power satellites are just for using solar energy for electricity, but reflectors, because they just um, uh, reflect sunlight, they can help um, the, the climate change in different ways to, to use the clean energy in different ways. And there's uh, one application is uh, biofuel, and um, there are these uh, ponds of, uh, of different. Uh, um, uh, don't know, but like it's it's like this this algae sort of uh, um, uh, creatures that, that generates um, uh, energy by by way of um, you know photosynthesis and so on. And we can illuminate these farms to um, just uh, you know enhance their photosynthesis and other things. And we can um, use sunlight in this way as well. Or it's a bit controversial, um, but I'll talk about more controversial things in a second, is that, is that we can illuminate forests uh, to enhance carbon capturing because, because the, 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 the plants do um, photosynthesis, um, that, that uses, uh, uh, uses carbon from atmosphere to generate oxygen. So if we illuminate the forest, someone proposed this, I didn't. Um, we can enhance the uh, carbon capturing. And it's just, uh, some other applications that are other than car, um, uh, the, the climate. And that's uh, maybe on-demand illumination of disaster areas at night or northern latitudes in winter as, as um, Herman of Earth uh, envisioned. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I talked about comparison. I was, I was hoping to give like uh, maybe more sort of generic comparison at the end of, of those two things, but I, I think I've, I've talked about most, most, uh, most of the things. Um, solar power satellite is a massive system with a lot of complexity, but delivers more energy, potentially with uh, much less in, um, interruption of the atmosphere. Orbiting solar reflectors uh, are a much less complex system. Um, Instead of uh, you know beaming down electricity, they just beam down sunlight uh, by way of using the intuitive sort of um, way of using them as mirrors, uh, and can be used for other things as well. And this, I think, uh, sort of essential uh, uh, comparisons uh, here. So what else? Um, this is um, oops, right, where did this go? Um, can we start this back? Right. Okay. okay. I need to go a little bit. Sorry about this. Quick recap. Yeah. I'm really bad with technology, apparently. Uh, that's not. That's not very uh, <laughs> promising from someone Again, who does I can take stuff. things into space, but can I can I do presentations clearly? Okay. Yeah. So this is what I want to talk about. This is this is uh, probably the, the most controversial things that I think I'll talk about here, and that's the solar geoengineering. That's another proposal for uh, mirrors in space, and that's really. Um, this is a very big sort of uh, system that's unlikely to happen in our lifetimes, but if uh, climate change uh, goes out of control, maybe we can consider it. I don't know. Uh, I, I, I'm not the one uh, proposing this either. But uh, there's, a, there's a thing called geoengineering, and that's, uh, that aims to, to make a large-scale engineering uh, interventions um, on the Earth to, um, well, to... to to really slow down the climate change. And one of the things that I propose is to putting, putting giant mirrors in space to reflect sunlight that's incoming to the earth um, by just you know, dimming the, the, the sunlight that's, that's coming to the earth. Uh, some people argue that that's, that's possible to, to uh, decrease the, the, the increase of, of temperature in the, um, in the atmosphere. 
by just doing this, by dimming the Earth's sunlight about 2%. Uh, this is not like uh, we're going to be in, in total shadow or something. It's just we'll probably not even notice the difference between sunlight now, especially in London uh, or in Scotland um, uh, or anywhere else. But um, there's a possibility that this can help us uh, to slow down uh, the, the climate change. This doesn't do anything per se in terms of uh, providing clean energy or anything, but just uh, um, does like a really like a rapid uh, intervention on on climate, but this is very sort of you know controversial. So uh, it does feel like a last ditch yeah, effort. There's, a, there's a lot of ethical, energy. yeah. There's a lot of ethical uh, discussion around uh, uh, space-based geoengineering uh, proposals, and I'm not one of them proposing it. Just I just wanted to mention because this is an application of reflectors, um, and it's related to climate. Um, and yeah, um, I hope you enjoy That's That was the last slide of me and uh, um, uh, I hope it was something interesting and I hope it was just enough with some sci-fi uh, notes as well in it. And uh, thank you very much for listening to this. Yeah. Thank you very much for that fascinating talk. I mean, uh, we do often talk about the positives of solar energy and solar power. But here, seeing the actual applications, the drawbacks, the positives, it's a really fascinating uh, um, outlook in, into it. And about melting the ice caps <laughs> using the mirrors, no. that's a really positive uh, spin no. on global warming, no. uh, a really capitalist really spin yeah. on uh, global well. warming. Um, so I can open the uh, floor up for questions now, but I have one myself. Okay. It's mainly about regulation. So mm -hmm. I, I focus on IR, international relations myself. So regulation does interest me. Yeah. Uh, how does this pan out uh, legally? Um, so for, I think um, there are a couple of things for solar power satellite. And that's uh, one thing is that special orbit. And that's uh, the, the use of that orbit is really regulated by, uh, for example, for communication satellite, it's regulated by International Telecommunications yeah. Union. So they actually allocate, say, for, uh, for the UK, with the latitude of the UK, it's that that region is allocated, and I don't know how the really the um, specifics of this this uh, goes on, but there's um, there's that regulation on, on choosing that the latitude and so on. And obviously, if you want to build um, a, a massive receiver on ground, um, depending on I guess the the geographic location, there might be some discussions, you know, uh, territorial disputes between between countries, and that's. Uh, that's something uh, to be, I guess, figured out between countries. Um, on the other hand, I think for orbiting solar reflectors, the most of the regulatory issues come down on this additional sunlight that, that comes onto the Earth. And there is this, um, what we call a stray light, that the, the light sort of spills out of, of a solar power farm, because that's some, something that we cannot always avoid. Um, and I guess the argument is there is that the illumination levels are only a couple of full moons mm -hmm. strong. So that's, uh, that we believe is something that might be acceptable if, if, uh, if the positives of solar energy can be, can be seen, really. And um, for the specific applications of reflectors, the, the orbital pass that, that really delivers solar energy is really 15 to 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. So it's really short and really sort of dim light. So we believe that might be um, uh, acceptable. The astronomers might like it because it will be a bright uh, object in space. Um, and sort of our argument on that is, is that it, we mostly uh, propose this concept or, or well, uh, investigate this concept for most of the sunrise times. It's not necessarily the uh, best time for night sky observation. Um, yeah, and also the solar farms are not really uh, next to telescopes, uh, space telescopes. So that's that's another argument that uh, we have um, with this. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? If not, I've got more of my own. Yeah. Okay. Don't know. <laughs> Hi again. Uh, nice to meet you. Nice to and meet thanks you. a lot for great uh, topic. Uh, I've been interesting. Uh, it's not just about scientific part, but also industrial part. 
uh, what's the most interesting and uh, prospective ways uh, attracting new space representatives, like let's say Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and uh, others, yeah? Richard Branson also. Mm -hmm. uh, was there interesting more uh, in space industry? Because before in, let's say, old space race, there were only players, governmental part, mm -hmm. like USA, yeah. Russia, and others, because they had a lot of monies and yeah. interested more like military uh, sites. But what's the interesting part in new space race? You tell me. So uh, why should they be interested in yeah. this? Um, Anitization part. Yeah, I mean, the, I think the, the, in, the, in terms of uh, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and all these uh, big players, I think they're rockets for the, you know, the access to space and commercialization is, is one opportunity because NASA or you know, other space agencies, especially when you know, as long as International Space Station or some space station is, is in orbit, there will be an interest in sending astronauts there. And, um, and it, space is an expensive business. It's, it's a lot of money. Um, uh, and I, I think there's a lot of um, really the, the profit for them in this one. And also, um, I think there's, uh, uh, for these kind of technologies, I think there's, well, Elon Musk himself is, um, I don't know, a CEO of, of Tesla, right? Uh, so he's, he seems to be at least uh, interested in, in these kind of uh, more uh, cleaner uh, sort of energy and using this more efficient systems and more uh, sort of a low carbon sort of system. So I think that's, uh, it, it, it's technology and, and uh, developing these systems and putting up space will, will need a lot of technology. And those technologies will be used, say, um, for, say for Elon Musk in, in specific example, he wants to go to Mars and, and build uh, you know, human settlements there. And if we have technologies to, to assemble things in orbit or manufacture things in orbit or send things in, in orbit with, uh, with very big uh, rockets, very powerful rockets and generate, you know, uh, solar energy in, in orbit. So this will be useful for, for them to, to, you know, pursue their, uh, I think, um, I don't know, the aims or goals, both in terms of, I guess, commercially and, and their own uh, interests themselves. Had second part of question because mm -hmm. it's uh, just a bit interesting because uh, he's exactly huge perspectives and as you mentioned maybe another aims like mega feel free or something yeah uh, but let's see like entrepreneurial or commercial side uh, what's the new prospects in space because uh, I learned now very huge information mm -hmm. about the solar systems and the solar money uh, sites industries as well. But uh, why new space players mm -hmm. uh, like Elon Musk and others, they've been interested more to make a money or monetization through the tourism or logistics or something else. And what the prospects maybe in that side or in solar, uh, how you say it, solar technologies? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, don't, I don't quite know actually why. I mean, I think this, this specific example is, is really for, um, you know, using the sun uh, in, a, in a more efficient, effective manner, and 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 really making an impact, making solar energy impact in in climate change, and in terms of uh, other space technologies, I think, especially the the on orbit manufacturing uh, and and uh, assembly in orbit is is a technology that needs developing, and I think one of the challenges we have now uh, in terms of um, you know, sending things into space. We need to design them, manufacture them uh, on Earth. And, and that really um, is subject to a lot of like uh, mechanical loads and the rockets are, you know, dangerous for the, the, the systems themselves. And if you, if, you if you really manufacture in orbit, you don't have to design everything on, on Earth. You can just send it up there, raw material, without uh, worrying about uh, the satellite solar panel getting broken and things like that in, in, in the rocket. And you can just build it uh, up there and it might be much easier for them. And in, in terms of space tourism, I think that's, uh, that's really, uh, uh, you know, people want to go to space. <laughs> yeah, I think that's exciting, yeah.
Okay, we have time for two more questions. So let me pass over to this gentleman at the front and that lady at the back. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, I think I think one of the uh, sort of uh, potential. Uh, <laughs> I was the question. question was... Please. Uh, thank you very much for this educative lecture, and it's very inspiring. Mm -hmm. My question is actually a little uh, regressing from the original space mm -hmm. uh, technology. Yeah. Now, the solar energy, mm -hmm. can it be replaced by the conventional means of energy that we use in Europe or Asia or anywhere mm -hmm. else? Uh, is it possible to replace solar energy with the conventional uh, means of energy? Uh, uh, when, because you say that it's always sunny in space, yeah. but uh, we don't find any sunny on in 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 here, <laughs> uh, and I, I don't know how it is uh, far away. Are we very far away to replace the solar solar power? Uh, uh, how long it will take? Because you know the electricity prices are going up. I know. You, you know so you better hurry up. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you. Well, the idea the idea here is actually uh, use sun more uh, efficiently more effectively so instead actually instead of using coal for example using sun more effectively such that we can have um you know we can use really this endless source of energy more more effectively for electricity generation but i think i think in terms of um if, if something to replace the um i don't know sun or other energy i think that will be nuclear and that's uh while i'm not against nuclear energy myself I think there are a lot of uh, political, you know, or or a lot of discussion uh, that might be, um, you know, in terms of the dangers and and uh, associated with it. Um, because in terms of the, the efficiency, we have, I, I think that the best we have is nuclear for now. But there's a lot of, you know, ethical and and uh, regulatory and and political discussions around it. So I'm not sure if. Uh, uh, in this case, I think sun is much more safer. Uh, let's go for sun. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the nice talk. Yeah. Uh, I have also some kind of related yeah. questions. Did you assess the cost of it? How much do you need price of the electricity you generate from the reflectors? Right. So um, that's not my uh, work in our project, but uh, uh, my colleague is is doing that work. So I'll maybe talk on behalf of him. Um, so that really depends on uh, whether the uh, launch prices, uh, the rocket prices, will will decrease or not. So uh, with the with the prices we have, um, uh, the, the the price of rockets we have, um, it doesn't seem uh, today that this is a feasible system. But it may be feasible in maybe 10, 15 years time, because there's there's a prospect of, uh, you know, space, access to space being really cheap. And with that, I think that electricity prices can be um, decreased to levels um, that's uh, comparable or lower than the, the current standards, but, uh, you know, using the sun instead of, you know, conventional systems. So that's uh, all I can say, because I'm not an expert on this, but I, uh, I know that the, the biggest uh, cost driver is the launch currently. And that has been always the case for other systems as well. Um, uh, I don't know, but I think, I, I think it can be a big contributor if there's, uh, there's a real, real interest in, in this, uh, these kind of systems. And as I said, uh, US and Japan, as, uh, as, as China as well, long-term interest in this. And the UK government recently put money uh, to actually assess the feasibility of uh, a solar power satellite uh, to, to, to the UK reaching its uh, net zero goals. Um, and if there is, if if a government puts money in it, there there might be, you know, some interest in this, and that's a that's a good thing. And um, and as I said, with the solar power satellites, you can power a really large city, and and. Uh, that's promising, I think, because the sun the, or the solar energy doesn't really do that unless we have like really, really huge systems, yeah. as far as I know.
<laughs> okay, thank you very much for your questions. And thank you very much, Dr. Tilik, for your fascinating talk and answering all of our questions. Uh, also, thank you to everyone who tuned in. Uh, we loved having you. Now, uh, I'll, I'm happy to say the refreshments in the back are open, so please help yourselves. And can we give Dr. Tilik